Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we're in my classroom to do a bit of dissecting today. Our subject isn't actually a living organism, but rather a large weather system. Yep, we're gonna dissect hurricanes. So before we get going though, we need to understand the fact that every hurricane is unique weather system. So whether they're found in the Indian Ocean or the North Atlantic, or wherever their name is Andrew, Zeta, or somewhere in between, the structure and dynamics are similar. However, their effects vary widely. First off, we need to discuss the conditions necessary for a hurricane to form. We call that cyclogenesis. The first aspect a storm needs to form is its fuel source. So the fuel source for all hurricanes is the thermal energy stored in warm ocean water. Researchers have shown that tropical cyclones do not form until the water temperature at its formation is at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit or about 26 and a half degrees Celsius. In addition, this layer of water has to be deep. The warm water has to be at least 55 meters or 100 feet deep. So this means you won't see tropical cyclones normally form right on the coast, but rather in waters that are deep enough to support their formation because there isn't enough fuel to get the tropical cyclone up and going. Almost as important as the water temperature is actually the winds at the surface and at altitude. So the difference in wind speeds from the surface and altitude is known as wind shear. And wind shear is a really important component in not only the development of hurricanes, but also their later strengthening in their life cycle. Hurricanes rely on the wind shear for the convection in the thunderstorms to rise high into the atmosphere in order to strengthen the individual thunderstorms and the hurricane itself. You'll sometimes hear about storms traveling into an environment that's known as hostile for development. So this is normally due to high wind shear. So what happens in these cases is the winds are faster at altitude than they are at the surface. When this happens, the winds at the high altitude will cause the convection currents to either get pulled away or not rise as high as they normally would. And this limits the strength of the thunderstorms in the system. So we've got a weather system in an environment that's conducive to development. We now have ourselves a tropical cyclone. But what exactly does that mean? Well, first off, tropical cyclones are all low pressure air masses. Low pressure systems involve air moving from the outside of the storm into the center where it then rises. This rising of air is what we call an updraft. So in the Northern Hemisphere, low pressure systems rotate counterclockwise, while in the Southern Hemisphere, it rotates clockwise with the same updraft mechanics at work. Tropical cyclones tend to form an eye once they reach a particular level of strength. In fact, the eye of a hurricane is probably its most well-known part, and in particularly strong hurricanes, these eyes can actually be seen from outer space. The eye forms at the center of the circulation of the storm, where the main updrafts of the storm occur. Now, scientists aren't totally sure or what causes an eye to form, as you don't normally see eyes in other powerful low pressure systems. Some theories state that once a hurricane has high enough winds, the circulating winds cut off the convection in the center, while other theories discuss complex interactions of air parcels or chunks of air at the center of the storm, which then creates the area of clear weather that's in the eye. But regardless, the eye is actually quite impressive. Winds can drop dramatically and can actually be calm within the eye, and the sun can be shining at times even though the eye of a hurricane is not always totally clear. While the eye is relatively calm, the eye wall or the band of clouds immediately around the eye are where the strongest winds and rain occurs. This area of extremely strong convection surrounds the eye and helps keep the eye clear, like I said before. In weaker tropical storms and tropical depressions, the eye wall is not present, but there is a center of circulation that given enough strengthening can become the eye wall. So like the exact mechanics of the cause of the eye forming, the eye wall and its formation is still a matter of debate. Emanating from the center of the storm is a series of convection bands called spiral bands, or you might hear them as called rain bands. So in these bands, convection loops occur, causing heavy rains and high winds as well. Though the winds aren't normally as fast as they are in the eye Wall. The rain bands actually hold the largest percentages of moisture in the storm. And if rain bands travel over the same area as the storm moves over time, a phenomenon called training occurs, where extreme amounts of rain may fall. When you look at post-storm assessments of rainfall, you can clearly see where the rain bands have trained through the area. For a hurricane, we associate high winds even more than the rain that falls. After all, we categorize hurricanes by their maximum wind speed. So when you look at diagrams of hurricanes, you'll often see the wind field on the right side of the storm's forward motion. 
in the northern hemisphere, the opposite, of course, southern hemisphere. So this is a simple case of net force, or a concept you might remember from middle and high school. So the right side of the storm is where the winds are traveling in a direction that is the same as the direction that the storm is traveling. So what this means is that the speeds add up, and the relative wind speed increases compared to the other side, where the forward direction of the storm partially counteracts the wind speeds of the storm. Determining the maximum sustained winds of a storm is a little more than simply taking out a wind sock and checking the wind speed. Maximum sustained winds are measured at 10 meters or 33 feet above the surface in order to consider the impact of friction where the winds of the storm interact with the Earth's surface. Offshore buoys will collect data that's automatically transmitted, or if they're within range, hurricane hunters will actually fly their aircraft into the storms and drop sensors that collect atmospheric data on the way down. Now with this data, meteorologists can calculate the maximum sustained winds of the storm. A key aspect of tropical cyclone development is that a tropical cyclone is a self-reinforcing cycle. The stronger the storm becomes, the more symmetrical and defined the structure of the storm becomes. At first, tropical systems can be a loose collection of thunderstorms, but by the time they develop into a hurricane, they have the classic characteristics of a storm that we know so well. These characteristics are beneficial to meteorologists attempting to forecast the strength of storms in areas with limited buoy coverage or out of the range of hurricane hunter aircraft. Scientists have developed a system of comparing the development of tropical cyclones to previous tropical cyclones, and this process is known as the Dvorak technique. The system was developed by American meteorologist Vernon Dvorak and involves comparing satellite footage of the tropical cyclone to footage of cyclones with known characteristics and atmospheric data. Since tropical cyclones and hurricanes have similar characteristics in their stages of development, if a new storm has the characteristics of a storm observed in the past, it should have the same wind speed and pressure gradients. Now while this was initially done by hand by scientists, the Dvorak technique these days is completely automated by computers who can look more deeply into the conditions and make comparisons that might not be noticed by scientists looking by hand. Tropical cyclones can strengthen explosively if the ingredients for strengthening is in enough quantities. This is since tropical cyclones are essentially large engines that use the heat from the ocean to fuel their growth. The initial energy remember to start the tropical cyclone comes from thermal energy stored in the warm ocean water. As you know, this warm water fuels the convection cycles that form the initial thunderstorms in what we call the tropical wave. As the storm organizes and the low pressure system develops further, the rain bands create continuous convection loops. Once an eye wall forms, a different type of energy transfer occurs around the eye wall. So because the winds and updrafts are traveling at such high speeds, the air actually doesn't have time to slowly release its thermal energy like the convection loops in the rain bands. So the result is that the air expands quickly, cooling rapidly as a result due to the change in air pressure. This type of cooling is what we call adiabatic cooling, and this cooling helps to create the shield of cirrus clouds that covers the mature hurricane. As long as the storm stays over the source of fuel, this heat engine will continue to take heat from the oceans and convert it into kinetic energy in the form of the winds. You might think that the energy might fuel the motion of the storm, but that's actually not the case because the planet wind patterns actually guide the storm and control its motion. Which, by the way, if you're interested in learning more about where contr what controls where hurricanes go, you can watch my other video on hurricane motion somewhere around here in order to learn more. As a hurricane intensifies and forms an eye wall, the eye wall actually begins to shrink as the storm becomes so organized. Once a hurricane reaches major strength, there are 115 miles an hour, 185 kilometers per hour, an interesting phenomenon begins to occur with the eye wall of the storm. As the storm becomes so organized and the eye wall becomes so small, the innermost rain band strengthens to the point where they actually start developing a second eye wall. This new eye wall robs the existing eye wall of moisture and warm air, causing it to collapse. Once the old eye wall collapses, the new eye wall begins to strengthen and shrink. Eye wall replacement cycles were discovered by scientists in the United States in the 1960s as they sought methods to artificially weaken hurricanes. Now, while they found they couldn't artificially weaken hurricanes, their observations discovered eye wall replacement cycle, and replacement cycles have become quite important for hurricane forecasting, as learning when a replacement cycle is occurring can help inform of how strong a major hurricane be at landfall. The difference between a major hurricane making landfall in the middle of a replacement cycle or not can be the difference between a category three and a category five storm at landfall and the resulting change in winds and damage. There's plenty of ways for a tropical cyclone 
to strengthen, well, there's plenty of ways for it to weaken. A major factor in the weakening of tropical cyclones, as you know, is wind shear. So wind shear, of course, occurs when the winds blow at different speeds and directions or at different altitudes in the atmosphere. So when wind shear occurs, the convection adiabatic cycles that fuel the growth of the storm get blown away, allowing for the energy to be dispersed before the loop is able to complete itself. Without these loops of energy being completed, the storm can't sustain itself, weakening as a result. Like your car, a loss of fuel means that a hurricane can't operate. So for most cases of hurricanes, this is the result of hurricanes passing over islands or making landfall. So the interaction with the land removes the source of fuel for the storm to continue to grow and sustain itself, meaning that eventually the wind speeds drop as the energy loops begin to collapse. Once a storm is fully over land, there's no fuel to sustain the storm, and, and given enough time, the storm expends all of its energy and dissipates. An additional cause for the storm to weaken when over land is that of friction. So whether it's a shed, a tree, a neighborhood, or a mountain range, anything that rises from the Earth's surface blocks a small bit of wind, causing friction to occur. Because the winds can't flow smoothly off the surface like over the ocean, the energy loops again fall apart because of not only a lack of fuel, but because the updrafts can't even begin because they're being blocked at the surface. So this is why you'll see storms cross over islands and weaken in the hours after this transit, because the increased friction traveling over land reduces the available energy transfer. Once the storm gets back over open water, the storm then re-strengthens. So if eyewall replacement cycles, wind shear, or a landfall can't weaken a storm, the final method of dealing with a tropical cyclone involves it moving out of the tropical latitudes and into the mid-latitudes. This change of location and the resulting change in wind patterns what it'll end up doing is cause the hurricane to change into a more common mid-latitude low-pressure storm system. And this process, of course, is known as extratropical transition, which you might sometimes hear on the news. Now, extratropical transition can actually be really complicated, but simply put, the transition changes the fuel source from warm water in the ocean to differences in air pressure as the storm interacts with other air masses. So when this happens, a cold front then forms where this interaction occurs. And these storm systems can actually still be really strong as it retains all the energy and storm water vapor from when it was over the ocean operating as a tropical cyclone. This means that these storms can cause damage in weather conditions just as if the tropical cyclone was making landfall there, as seen by Hurricane Dorian that hit Atlantic Canada in 2019 with hurricane force winds. Even Europe can be affected by hurricanes and transition into extra tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic, as seen by Hurricane Katia that transitioned from a Category 4 hurricane between the Bahamas and Bermuda and then managed to eventually hit Ireland and the United Kingdom as a powerful storm with wind gusts of over 100 miles an hour, about 160 kilometers per hour back in 2011. So there you go, a complete dissection of a tropical cyclone. So we talked about the factors necessary for the creation of a tropical cyclone, what causes them to intensify into hurricanes, and then when it causes them to eventually disappear. So this is the second and last episode in my series on the dynamics of hurricane development and motion. Here on the Gulf Coast, we're very aware of the effect effects of hurricanes in terms of high wind, storm surge, flash flooding, and everything that goes with it. But when it comes to forecasting, we're not quite as sure about what is going on because the science behind tropical cyclone formation is only just becoming available on the internet to amateurs and people with interest in weather forecasting. However, as the technology gets better, we learn more about how these tropical cyclones form and go through their life cycle, which means our forecasting becomes better, which of course means that we can then save lives and property. This is an episode of Phenomena on Explain, a series of videos that helps you understand what's going on in the world around you. This video is aligned to the Louisiana Student Standards for Science and the Next Generation Science Standard. This video aligns to 7-MS-ESS2-5, which talks about how interacting air masses lead to weather systems like, you know, hurricanes. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, first off, click the like button and then also click the subscribe button and click on the bell icon for notification. And again, I hope you enjoyed it. If you like it, please subscribe and thanks for watching.